Dawn of Dragons, Season 3, Episode 6, Through a Glass, Darkly. Year 1523, 23 days after our first snowfall. 22 of these days we have been under siege, day in and day out. The first week they seemed to toy with us, small sorties and some sporadic skirmishes, making us believe we were winning. But then came the real terror, as undead legions started coming in the dusk or in the evening or even the middle of the night, breaking us slowly, soon. We didn't realize the last time some of us had slept, living in a constant state of high alert, hearts racing when you lay down as if there was too much tea or coffee. The last two weeks have been a blur. We've lived in a rotation, commanding the trebuchets in sparse teams with only one leader to control the barrage. Father, <laughs> You'll be pleased to know my mousy hair is luckily not matted as it hangs to my shoulders. This is amazing, <laughs> given the fact bathing hasn't been a luxury we have afforded ourselves as regularly as we probably should. My team is very forgiving of the rancid symphony of odors. We... <laughs> we just try to do our best to ignore them. Honestly, once it is mentioned, it can take hours to forget it, so we prefer not to torture ourselves. The day started with their new normal vanguard of skeletal warriors, shambling bones of the restless dead eagerly cascading into our weapons, as if hoping for some sort of respite from the torment of undeath. This was followed by sorties of mercenaries, all from bloodthirsty troll, if I were to guess. They are all orcs and men mainly, though we have heard of more elves and possibly dwarves in their ranks. <laughs> I'm personally not surprised. After all, the lust for gold cares not about its victims as it corrupts the soul of the mercenary. I'm one of the few of us from the farms of nearby Tova, I believe. Of course, Grayson, the boy who used to tease me for my tomboyishness in school, is here. We actually rode in together. He's different now. A shadow of maturity hangs over him, no doubt from his time at the front line. There may be more of us in the local militia being mustered as a backstop. We fear putting these untrained farmers, bakers, and laymen into the battle. They claim they are all willing to protect the free world against the growing power of Lord Pallas, but... Father... I do not have the stomach for sending them to slaughter. I can see the pain in Lord Alvar's eyes when he looks at them. There is a dwarf berserker among their ranks, one of the ones who came to join us the night before the first assault. I remember him really enjoying the provisions we brought to their meeting. He's probably the only seasoned warrior among them, and that only means they will be like a mob on the battlefield. I should stop. It's sounding like I'm complaining, and as you taught me, Father, there's no good in doing that. It, it's just... Morale is very low. We lose some of our own every day, but it seems no matter how many we slay, they come back the next day as if nothing happened. We started noticing some of their dead coming back in the unholy vanguard. Or it could have been our minds playing tricks on us. Well, today started as the other days have, and as the day progressed, it seemed today would be more of the same as before. But. Well, I would be proven wrong, yet again. Captain Warren! The center's pouring towards us! Pikeman, hold your life! Yeah! <laughs> Time to die, scum! Not today! <laughs> Benedict! You take Bryce and push forward with those pikemen! Yes, Captain! The battlefield had churned mud for almost a month in this area till now, 
The mud was in two or three foot mounds throughout where their feet had pushed them from the originally flat earth. The moist sound of sludge under their boots was muffled by the din of steel, leather, and flesh clashing violently. Laura's face was caked with mud on one side, matting her ash-colored hair to her cheek back to her left ear. The battle sounds faded in her head for a moment as she took a breath, leaning on her worn longsword. We will persevere. Night Lord, guide us. Ah, it is as I have foreseen, most honored cobalt. Their faith is fading, breaking. Yes. The four of them stood on horseback at the top of the hill overlooking the battlefield to the east. At the far end, a few miles away, was the Celestine Tower, glinting in the noon sunlight. Una's eyes were closed behind her dark hood, but Cobalt knew she didn't need eyes to see. She was a seer and a gifted one, considering she served the Dreadlord Dekion. And it was good to note was still alive, like the golden-eyed Dabria who rode next to her on the far right. His undead legions were led by only a handful of living centurions, such as Dabria who then commanded hundreds of undead on the battlefield. Una was different. There was something or someone inside the young woman. Her hair fell like raven's feathers, framing her face from behind the dark hood, a blackened spear held in her hand. Hmm. Now, as they are frozen in fear, we must snap them. <laughs> snap them? And how will you do that? Using our undead ogres, perhaps? Hmm. How about the banshees? We can send them out this evening. No, Dabria. No banshees. Hmm. I believe it may be time to show them the true power this army possesses. Dabria recoiled slightly from the veiled insult, but looking at Una, her eyes opened brief enough, bringing her back into control of her emotions. Cobalt didn't seem to notice, turning to the dark-eyed man on her left. She noted the dark beard <laughs> coiled from his chin, moved slightly, as he smiled through a sideways glance back at her coolly anticipating her plan. Tell me, Azure, how are you feeling today? <laughs> I would love to stretch out a bit. Be my guest. Gladly. <laughs> Azure slid off the horse and took a few steps forward through the clearing and down the hill. Taking in a deep breath, he threw his arms out and down to the ground, groaning in the short burst of intense but welcomed pain. In a mere second, he was on all fours with a reptilian head towering into the sky 20 feet. Stretching out from his body were great mustard yellow and blue wings. His human form was now replaced with that of his natural magnificence. That of a deep Sapphire Blue Dragon. Are you sure? Yes. Of course I'm sure. See, after weeks of this, I better be sure. He's not sure. Hey, I am. You should be too. You were with me. Not that much with you. For weeks, the party had been exploring the upper section of the central tower while Cordelia was studying the selection of leather-bound tomes in the great mezzanine, with Lorvana helping by recalling stories and songs of long ago. Though the selection was relatively much smaller than that of the ivory library she was used to studying in, it still was very impressive. After the first ten days, Zorin decided that he and Erlen would find a way up into the shaft itself. It was then that he realized it did not run parallel with the stairwell going up, but had two 90-degree bends before continuing straight up into the darkness. They were now following this leg up a long spiral staircase that seemed to climb forever. 
Well, it still doesn't make sense why it would go this way. Just... But... But I would trust in your expertise. Well... Thank you. Vix, did you just concede to Zorin? I... In fact, did. Wait. Really? Absolutely. At least someone gives me some respect around here. Expertise in his field, after all, includes hiding lockpicks in uncomfortable places. Hey, it... It was my boot. Sure it was. (laughs) Whatever you say, expert. Shut up. Soon the party came to the top of the stairs where, after a short landing of about ten feet, a door lay in front of them. Strong wind pushing against the iron-bound oak of the door, and the shards of sunlight around the frame was a noticed warning of what lay on the other side. They guarded their eyes from the forgotten daylight as Zorn and Erlin lifted the oaken bar and opened the door. As anticipated, the sun blinded them as they walked out onto the 20-foot platform that was ringed with a four-foot-high battle, not for repelling any kind of arrow at this distance above the ground, but for something to hold onto from this height to avoid tipping over into the expanse below. Clouds rolled close, and even some smaller wisps stretched out below their level. Wow. Well, this is the top. How high is this again? that me feeling that or you, Sophie? I'm sorry if it's... Stop, Zane. It's not helping. What's that? Uh, oh, this is... I'll, I'll wait for you all inside. <laughs> She'll be okay. Wow, would you look at that? Man, you can see forever. Zorn and his friends looked at the battlefield before them. A quarter mile below, the wind whipping up in gusts that threatened to pull them from their footing, but only in their mind. The fresh air smelled clean from here, and though it felt icy, it was dry. The roar of battle seemed to be a dull rumble from this height. As everyone looked out, Cordelia went to the center of the platform, where she found a similar ring of tile that matched the one in the ceiling of the portal room. Hey Zorn, look at this. Uh, uh, Cordelia? What? Just come here, it's only a second. Uh, actually, I think you'll want to come here. (sighs) Fine. What is it? It better be... Oh. Oh, no. Horror sank in her heart as Zorn was pointing to a swift blue shape that flew close to the ground toward the troops guarding the tower. Ayla! Dead ahead! Oh, no! Night Lord, protect us! I looked out across the battlefield and saw a blue shape in the distance approaching quickly. Once it reached our front lines, fear cut through me to the core as lightning ripped a swath through our ranks. I was frozen in fear. I looked at Gustav, whose eyes were wide with concern. Sylvie's voice cracked through our paralyzed fear. Dragon! Don't wait for it! Go! Now! A dragon, and its huge, blue, serpentine form, was coming our way. By the gods themselves, a real dragon! I drew in a ragged breath. I turned back to the rope attached to the long arm of the trebuchet and took my usual review to make sure I didn't see any tearing. You heard her! Load! I joined my team as we rapidly turned the war machine, winding that massive arm down and lifting the several tons of counterweight off the ground simultaneously. Based off our last shot, I knew where our arc was. Ugh, too risky to adjust now. I imagined the arc and the line where the stone would be thrown. I knew how long the whipping motion took. I knew the feel of the leash in my hand. 
I was one with this machine now. Ready, Captain. And hold it. Well, this is a big one today. Then she looked at me and smiled. But you can't rely on me for this one. You, you know where your shot will go. Get it there. Yes, Captain. Yes, Captain. Captain Sylvie knew she would slow it down, that our disciplined formation this time needed to just act quickly. May the Night Lord guide your hands. Fire at will! We held the line of trebuchet like coiled serpents, waiting to strike. The dragon let out another blast into supply wagons at the edge of the river, almost in range. I began to hear our war machines launch. Steady. It came closer. Fire! I heard Gustav launch. One, two, three, now! And pulled my line as well. I watched the four remaining stones sail through the air towards the dragon. The first, the dragon cut hard to the left and barely missed the second stone as well. But in doing so, overcorrected into Gustav's stone, and finally mine found its mark across its head, driving it towards a heavy skid into the ground. <laughs> yes! yes! Look at that! Yeah! That's... Yes! That's impossible. That was... Wait, what, what do you mean impossible? A trebuchet can't take down a dragon. But... I... Fix? It just did. I refuse to accept this. Magic. Absolutely. There must have been magic involved. Tons of it. Yes. Tons of it. Yes. <laughs> All the magic. Stop. Hey, so Zorn, check this out. Cordelia was standing next to the ring of tile again. Well, that's got to be it. Oh, I, I wonder if it opens from the same gear downstairs I used to crawl into it. But it still doesn't explain what the big spell component is. Wait. Vix looked around the platform and then at the sky itself. Snapping his fingers, he turned to the others, a proud grin on his face. Ha <laughs> ha! That's it! That's... what? The largest, most powerful spell component, my salt-crusted companion. <laughs> One we can't hold, Zoran. Behold. The sun. How did they get it down there if it was the bend in... Mirrors! Mirrors. Yes, you're such a basket of smart little kittens, aren't you? But the sun changes all day, doesn't it? So there must be something here to control it from down below. Zorin flipped a tile at the north side, revealing a double gear. He studied it briefly. Hmm. This appears to change two mechanisms independently on the same shaft. Now we need to look for some mirrors that have a hexagonal shaft to mount in this hole. Hey, I may have found where they are in the room next to the portal. It looks like a lab, but all kinds of large lenses, I thought. Without taking the sheets off. I suppose they could actually be mirrors. Ugh. Why didn't you take off the sheets and look? You don't get this far in life just lifting up sheets in spooky places, Erilyn. The group went back down to the room that Sophia described. Cordelia lifted the tan and dusty sheet which fell apart in her hands from centuries of no use and abandonment, revealing a polished silver disc. It was concave toward the middle and covered in a thick, clear glaze that retained and protected the reflective properties of the silver. Lifting the other moldering threads, they found two other identical discs. Zorn and Erlin went back to the tunnel above the portal, taking the disc with them. Finding identical points in the floor hidden under a loose tile, they placed the mirrors with a snap as they aligned to the ancient gear work. Over the next few hours, all were in place. Then they returned to the portal room for a final test. Okay, so 
There's no fancy words or spell work, I believe. And Vix, correct me. Oh. Oh. Oh, I will. If I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. Gladly. The sun will be the power source, and we can use the gems to talk to the other towers, provided... Provided they still have theirs activated as well. And it's not in parts everywhere like this one. Okay. Here we go. Cordelia absently played with the tied ends of a simple yarn bracelet on her left wrist. A twisted red and orange colored cord forming a faded and treasured friendship bracelet, one Sophie had made her when they first became friends. Meanwhile, Zorin and Erelin turned the large gear on the wall that opened the hatch in the ceiling. Now when it opened, the small aquamarine gems glowed next to the crank, increasing in intensity, something they didn't notice before. Also, the two smaller cranks would move which gems glowing in an arc, They noticed there was a second arc with a faint glow between two stones on one to the right and another one at the center. Let's line them up. I wonder, maybe it's a guide to the sun's position. Turning the wheels, the glowing light moved across the arc of gems until they lined up. As Erlen finished his adjustments, the room slowly began to glow until it was bathed in light. Yes, that's it! Cordelia's face glowed with excitement and anticipation. Cordelia, you were not wrong. She almost saw a smile from the elf's face, but she brushed it off as wishful thinking. Okay, here we go. The blue sapphire glowed brightly at the top in the sunlight. The various metals glinted and glowed, almost bringing the dragons depicted from their frozen state. To the left of the sapphire was coal black jet and then a deep red ruby. To the right of the sapphire was a emerald and finally a diamond. She reached to the diamond and pressed in on it. The diamond locked into place, glowing brightly and instantly. (laughs) Cordelia jumped back as the gate began to hum and streak tendrils of light across the frame like the tuning of a drum between the gems. Once the glow subsided, she could see another room on the other side. Similar to this one, only white marble with rose quartz. Several benches and a table were spread across the floor. Looking back at her friends, they all stood frozen in place and wide-eyed. Zorin shrugged slightly, with his eyes wide in disbelief. Can... can you step in? Well... Only one way to find out. She reached down and picked up a small fragment of an old white candle from the ground and simply tossed it into the room. What is that? Huh? Oh. <clears throat> uh, yes, what is it, Moira? I thought I heard something over by the portal. Let's see. Cordelia heard footsteps approach the portal in a familiar voice. The tall man came into view. His familiar bald head, rich sepia in tone, topped the deep blue robes and was riddled with the familiar tattoos she remembered. Well, hello, Cordelia. Welcome back to the Ivory Library. How can your fellow librarians assist you? Rue is played by David S. Deer. Moira Rosewind is played by Lane McCaleb. Ayla Forsyth is played by Elizabeth Riggs. Benedict Shieldhart, played by Brian Dowling. Bryce is played by Harlan Guthrie. Cordelia Shieldhart is played by Jolene Frescus. Gustav is played by David Tilstrom. Sylvie is played by Melinda Barkhouse Ross. Warren is played by Shannon Roby. Sophie is played by Sarah Jenkins. Mix the Chaotic, played by... Daniel Nichols from the Happy Go Lucky Podcast. Zorin, played by Cody Miller. Azure is played by Heath Martin. <laughs> Cobalt is played by Ellie Gossage. Erilyn, voiced by Jordan Thompson. Una is played by Becky Atchley. Zane is played by Storm S. Cone. Dabria is played by JD Rose. And I'm Mike Ashley, your narrator and the voice of Keldor. 
Thanks to our patrons, Haley Munoz, Daniel Nichols, Jolene Fresquez, Brian Dowling, Colin Holmes, and Corey Fouch. You too can support the show by joining our Patreon. Check the show notes for the custom dice giveaway we are running. Stay tuned as the stone monks of the Ivory Library join in the fight against the dark army of Lord Palace. Until then, stay safe and remember the oath. <laughs>